sending my son to his death. I sat there planning how we were going to do this. We were almost 200 meters from the entrance of where we went in, and it was not an easy journey to get there. You're going through 20 centimeter slots, squeezes, climbs, crevasses. I was designing in my head a sort of remote operated vehicle system like my friends James Cameron and Bob Ballard do for their deep undersea explorers, you know, command centers and things. And I thought, well, I can't use robots, any people, and I'm sitting there in the dark thinking about this. Pretty soon I hear scrabbling, and then Matthew's head pops out of the slot. And because I'm going for Father of the Year, I didn't go, you know, are you okay? I went, and? <laughs> and he said to me as he looked at me, he said, Daddy, it's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. My hands were shaking so badly that I couldn't take the picture for three and a half minutes. When I looked at those pictures with appropriate scales, realizing how tiny that skull was, and we were on to something extraordinary. So, that night, I had to make a decision. It was Saturday night, October the 5th. How am I going to find people that can fit in there that have the expertise to do this? This design I had of this remote-operated excavation. And so I did what anyone would do. I put a Facebook ad out. That Facebook ad basically said, I need skinny people <laughs> who are willing to drop everything and come within the next three to four weeks to South Africa unpaid. I'll fly you out here and feed you. You, of course, have to have a degree in paleoanthropology, archaeology, paleontology, forensic sciences. You have to have skills in working in underground environments, climbing skills a plus. You have to have extensive excavation skills. Oh, and I'm not going to tell you what you're doing, and you can die while you're doing it. And I sent that out, thinking there are probably three people in the world that would fit that criteria. Within 10 days, I had over 60 qualified applicants, over 80% of them young women. Extraordinary. Out of those, I shortlisted a group. The original six that I shortlisted, just numbering one to 20 and after interviewing them, were not all women, contrary to what some people think. The sixth one was a man who had lied about his dimensions. <laughs> and so the seventh was a woman, thus making that extraordinary team that would eventually become known as the underground astronauts, and I take full responsibility for that name, and I know lots of people say it should be Spelionauts or Troglonauts or whatever, but I'll explain in a minute where that came from. I also decided to do something unusual. I decided that this might be the only chance in all of history that we could communicate live the discovery of a fossil hominid, the discovery of perhaps some of the rarest sought-after objects on Earth. And so I convinced National Geographic and Harder, my colleagues, that we would use social media and a blog site to live deliver this expedition, to bring that sort of excitement of the discovery and process that we undergo that most of the time stays in a black box somewhere back there. Of course, the risk was we'd contaminate the science. That is, that you'd never get it accepted in a journal after that, or that you would leak out this information and it would fail miserably, or worse, it wasn't what I thought it was, right in front of the whole world. On October 7th, we put a 60-person expedition in the field. It's one month after that ad went out. A 60-person expedition with safety cavers, scientists flown in from around the world, these six explorers who would be the front end of that all of the safety procedures that you need in place for that, the backup, the cooks, the, everything that goes with a big expedition like that. Between October 7th and October 10th, we laid three and a half kilometers of underground military-grade cable, video cable, audio cable, set up these camera systems. On October 10th, in the afternoon, the first teams went in and then brought out, in the afternoon, the first fossils. 
These were the kind of scenes we were looking at. It was all in infrared underground. And you can hope begin to see why they sort of became known as underground astronauts. They would leave us in all this equipment and they would work their way through. And we would catch glimpses of them almost in slow motion as they would move up the dangerous places where these cameras were. And then they would vanish for us from us for these minutes as they descended the chute where you cannot have any gear on you and no safety rope because they won't fit. Until they reappear four and a half minutes later and we get a communication symbol, uh, signal from a safety caver that they've arrived in the bottom of the chamber. And on and on that went. Extraordinary images. And then we saw the first recovery of material after using white light scanners, novel technology in this extreme environment that allowed us to map to precision to 0.1 to 0.3 of a millimeter. And as the first material came up, I realized that I had made a mistake. That in fact, the first material and then the second material and the third material indicated it was not a hominid skeleton. It was multiple hominid skeletons. By day two, we had three right femora. These are your thigh bone here. I assure you, hominids and primates don't have three right femora. By the end of the week, we had discovered more fossil hominids than been discovered at the richest site on the continent of Africa, which I could see from outside the, co the command center, Sturkfontein, in one week. By the end of the 21 days that we were in an expedition designed to take one hominid skeleton out that was lying in the dirt, we had discovered the largest assemblage of fossil hominids ever discovered in the history of this planet. We had by then over 1,300 hominid remains. We had also about a million followers in various social media watching us, interacting with us. The cavers would talk to them. They would come out, these wonderful explorers, and talk to a school in Cape Town or the United States or China, interviewed Filthy Dirty in the height of all of this excitement going on. It was the time of our lives, I assure you, as scientists. We all knew what we were doing and what was happening to us, which was unprecedented. We also knew some secrets that weren't going out on the social media. That is that we were experiencing an extraordinary context discovery. But we didn't leak that at that time because it was so remarkable and so unprecedented that we felt that no one would believe us. Now, I'm going to pause here for just a moment before I show you some of those wonderful fossils. Because a lot of people say it wasn't really that dangerous. What you guys are doing wasn't that extreme. That's not true. Just because no one died, that speaks to good planning and good safety measures. The extreme conditions that were going on under there did result in accidents. We just simply did not report them. This is the easy part of the journey. I can do this and do do this. This is not the hard part. The reason that these extraordinary people could do this is that they really are heroic. They're, they're extraordinarily trained. They're calculated risk takers. And they do a great and incredible job. Now, Rick here, that was an easy one, by the way. Rick here is about to walk down. This is a journey. This is what we do to get to Dragon's Back. This is the kind of system that you're in. These are the kind of passages that you're going through. This is to get to the hard part. One of the issues in a cave like this is it's not a deep cave. You're usually 30 to 40 meters below the surface. That means that the surface above you has been destabilized by tree roots and rainwater. Collapses can occur. You can see how those rocks are loose effectively. If one of them falls, you die at that point. Not to mention you're working in 
high humidity environments. The rocks are slippery. As Rick squeezes through this, I see some squeamish people in here. As Rick squeezes through this, he's going to take you up Dragon's Back for a moment. And then he's going to show you the slot. These people were doing this journey. These scientists, the cavers and explorers that supported them, were making this journey up to six times a day. These young women were working in this extreme environment for six to eight hours. That's looking down the chute. Now, I want you to look at what he's squeezing into right there and the kind of dangers of loose rocks. This rock would actually later fall on a, on a National Geographic photographer and crush his finger. And it's lucky no one's killed. Oh, and Rick can dislocate his shoulders here, just to show you. There you go. <laughs> Extraordinary explorers and scientists. <laughs> By the end of that work, we had discovered over two then small trips, 1,550 individual hominid remains, leaving thousands of them still in this chamber. All of that discovery recovered.